Okay, thank you. I'm also talking a little bit on this theme of sustainability. I think that in the area of regulating labor and global supply chains, one of the, the big problems is that we've thrown a lot at it. There's a lot of different approaches to regulating labor, both hard and soft, hybrid, multi-stakeholder, and yet we still land up with this governance problem. And really, what there's been small signs of improvements here and there, but what is how can you actually make it lasting? And it, my presentation doesn't answer that question, it only further frustrates, frustrates it, but it's something we should be talking. And I'm talking in English because I can't speak French, <laughs> no, um, but I understand to listen to it. So sorry, maybe by next time I'll speak. So uh, I'm going to be talking about a partnership between uh, an ILO program called Better Work and GAP. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Better Work because I've spent some time studying that. And like I just said, there's been a number of approaches to labor standards regulation, but we find ourselves still swimming around uh, in this context of a global governance deficit, in large part due to very complex supply chains. We often don't even know where workers are in the multi multiple subcontracting uh, locations, how to think about regulating for, for them. Um, so think there's that, and then thinking about how to regulate for workers, we do know where they are. There's weak enforcement, uh, the capacity of local stakeholders, maybe either not up to par, or maybe external interventions are interfering with that and undermining local capacity that does already exist. We as maybe sometimes assume it doesn't. Um, there are some improvements, call them patchwork improvements, like uh, the, re the fixes that come from exposés and consumer campaigns. Or even within better work, uh, there were some improvements. I'm going to talk a little bit about Lesotho, where the program lasted for six years uh, and then left, and things started to go to get a bit worse. So basically, we've talked about all these approaches, all these programs. Should we be shifting the conversation a little bit to uh, thinking about practices? And I come to that because in the end, I think it has a lot to do with changing behaviors and some of that coming from within. There was a panel this morning on changing global norms. And one of the things that uh, Tony said was that maybe part of this is aspirational. <laughs> maybe most of it is, maybe all of it is aspirational. I'm not really sure how it, it goes from strategy of a lead firm and plays out on a shop floor with those suppliers under intense pressures uh, internationally to really just keep up with with costs, let alone think about improving social dialogue and industrial relations in their factories. So can we think about shifting to practice instead of focus on program? But ironically, I'm now going to talk to you about a program to improve uh, labor standards. Better Work, for those of you who don't know, is an initiative of the ILO and IFC. It focuses on this win-win situation of improving compliance without negatively impacting competitiveness. It operates in seven countries. It used to operate in Lesotho as well, but the funding was pulled because only half the factories signed up, and that's a longer story, but let's just say it was short-lived. They're different from other approaches to regulation that they have this very comprehensive monitoring tool. They have remediation and training rather than pulling orders. They, they monitor on core labor standards and also basic working conditions. So it's comply with international core labor standards, but also your local law. They have offices on the ground, so it's not someone coming in once a year. There's locally established offices. That's the project advisory um, com committee happening at the national level. The global headquarters are in Geneva. So they have a global advisory board, then they have the project advisory committee in, the each, uh, in each country, and then within the factories, they establish performance improvement consultative committees, which are something like worker management um, committees. So that's better work. There's a lot of research on better work, uh, a number of people showing the link between, basically trying to make the business case for better work, showing a link between uh, program intervention and positive outcomes on, on different areas of employment, uh, sexual harassment, verbal abuse, the increased collaboration between parties, uh, establishment of arbitration councils, arbitration council. So there, there's some, some stuff supporting, some research supporting better work, and there's some research kind of questioning or raising some doubt about the sustainability of better work and the, the challenges that it faces. So, you know, and some of these are fully funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. And uh, in some of these countries, their countries, are, the industries are fully dependent on trade preferences. First of all, just the, the, the presence of it in the country level as a sustainability issue, but then also in the in the industry level, in the shop floor, 
changes you make, how do you actually sustain those? How do you incentivize actors to get behind ensuring improvements that are made continue to, to be made? And I did some research in Lesotho for, um, s for seven years. And I'm just going to tell you on one side, the general finding was that the program improved the situation in the first couple of years for workers. And then there was a bit of a leveling out and over time started to worsen. And after better work, things were going back towards square one. Skipping over a large story to basically say what, ex what explains improvements while better work was there. According to workers, this was all with focus groups uh, with workers. These photos that I'm showing are just to make the slides a little more interesting. They're not from this specific project with GAP. They're just work they're workers in Lesotho uh, while I was there. OK, so I think from hearing the workers' stories, what made it work while it was there was the functioning, the well-functioning performance improvement consultative committees, these PICs. That was used as a forum, like a mechanism for worker voice through which the Im relationship improved with managers and workers. And they were able to raise some grievances that got solved pretty quickly. And that, that, relation, that improvement in relationships started breaking down barriers to accessing labor standards that had previously um, been sort of kept from them due to poor supervisor relations and, and a host of other issues. I built to this point to say this, these picks show some evidence in other country studies of, of making improvements for workers. There's a couple of studies showing how they can, you know, through the, the tailored advice that they give to factories on developing and implementing improvement plans, it can help. Uh, they can help facilitate greater efficiency in factories by helping managers to understand what their workers want and also starting to break down the communication barriers. I, of course, there are some people who sort of question the the long-lasting effect of PICS, um, saying this sor sourcing squeeze and pressure that, that manufacturers are under sort of undermines the efforts of the PICS to focus on wage issues or uh, overtime issues. I mean, it's a bit overstated because better work doesn't focus on the wage issue. That's usually left to national uh, negotiating systems like wages advisory board. Um, there's also some evidence that takes time to warm up to the picks, cultural norms like managers and workers opening up to each other. It's a bit weird to, to get into that for some people in some countries. And sometimes the managers are only incentivized to participate in the meetings when someone from Better Work is there or has called the meeting. So there are some problems with it, but when it's working and, and Mark Anner lays out criteria for criteria for a well-functioning pick in a 2017 report that he wrote up, when it's working, it, it does have a positive impact. The, the positive impact I found, he found, doesn't do anything for strike rates in Vietnam, but I'm saying from worker perspectives about labor standards, it seems to show some improvement. Now, what Better Work is trying to do, they're trying to make this a little more sustainable and reach beyond Better Work countries, right? So this decent work for all, but Better Work is in seven countries. Um, how, do you, how do you sort of spread these good practices? And that's one question. How do you make that more sustainable through a supply chain? But also, how do you make it sustainable in the factory, in actual practice? How do you make this thing work to be an effective means for improved labor standards compliance for workers? brings us to the Better Work Gap Partnership on Workplace Cooperation. This is new, it's, a pilot, it's piloted with Gap from a year and a half ago, and I was contracted by Better Work to evaluate, do the phase one evaluation, and this is a little bit of what I found from the, from the evaluation. But the point of the partnership is to strengthen workplace cooperation in both Better Work and non-Better Work factories. These are th some of the supplier, these are where Gap is supplying from. So they, they want to, uh, expand that beyond the picks, train managers and workers to more effectively address and resolve non-compliance issues. The basic strategy is Better Work global training team trains Gap Inc. people, the ones who the auditors that go around and do the, the, train, the auditing in the supplier factories, trying to switch them from this auditor to trainer role. They train them with skills in social dialogue and industrial relations. I'll show you some of the modules. Then those go to their respective countries and train bipartite committees in the factories to equip those managers and workers with the skills they just learned. So it's kind of try, trying to pass on best practices that way. Some of those modules include workplace com communication, setting up bipartite committees, uh, problem solving, grievance mechanisms. So they get content training, but also, hey, here's how you can facilitate that in your factory with managers and, and workers in these different contexts. This. Um, 
so here's some photos. The one on the bottom left just to show how entertaining an interviewer I am. Uh, so there's a gap in Vietnam and Bangladesh and India. So the bottom two are GAP Inc. staff and the top are members of the management representatives from the bipartite committee. Uh, okay, so I did, I did interviews with 10 GAP staff and 10 of the bipartite committee, as well as the, the people at both at Better Work and GAP leading the, the project. Now the next slides, forgive me because, oh wait, no, there's this one first. All right, so challenges and opportunities for this program. And I chose this, at first I was gonna start building a model and then this was just the frame for this um, clip art and because it was called random to, like random piece to solution. And I was like, yeah, that, that sort of depicts what's happening. <laughs> so I just kept it and <laughs> put anything in it. Okay, this, so excuse me, okay, but this is sort of, I'm re re reporting in report-like fashion and I'll read to you some of the things. There's three components. There's the training materials, that you receive, and then there's the training from better work to GAP, and then GAP to in the factories. And I'll just recap, if you can't read this, on some of the, the, the challenges and the opportunities. First of all, with training, so some positive things, how this, how this whole thing is practicing and operating, um, how it's operating, how it's performing in practice, I mean to say. It was preparing GAP staff well for the training. It was easy for them to understand. There's a lot of pictures, visuals being used. They had session plans on how to deliver the training, and that was useful. Watching Better Work staff model that for them, how they can do it. They got good background on Better Work, because remember, there are some countries involved here who are not with Better Work, so they're learning about it. And, and it also gave them a good framework to, to base from, to adapt to their local context, because there might be some differences legally, culturally, um, and so on. But some problem areas linking up directly with the things that I just identified are strengths, is that while the materials were, were good, the gap in staff were not always, were not reading them in advance, and the bipartite committee members uh, were not receiving them in advance, and so it was too much to, to digest. Yes, it was easy to understand for GAP and some of the management members, but it's beyond a lot of the workers' um, comprehension with the way they had uh, worded things in the, the training material. So the education difference is, is vast between employers, the managers and the workers. Uh, it's too better work centric, it's focusing on be better work countries, so that was also hard to adapt from. And while it does give a good framework for adapting to the local context, we can't always think of local and national context. Some countries have multiple local contexts, vastly diverse cultures within a country, languages, everything. So think about the transferability of this training. Yes, you're getting a little farther than just better work countries, but it's just making a bit of an, another inch or something. And how do you actually make this transferable to, to an entire country? And then I made some suggestions, but for time, I'll skip. Oh, sorry, that was to give you some guide. Okay, so s now we're talking about the, the gap the, the training from Better Work to GAP. They were very positive about it. They appreciate that Better Work staff have a diverse worldly experience as opposed to them focusing on one country. Um, they, the workplace cooperation and communication were the big winners in terms of what was the, what um, was the most useful in the content and also how that ended up playing out. A lot of role play video. And there's some stuff coming out too, like, like cartoons, the use of cartoons for getting information across to workers. It might sound s silly, but it actually is a good mechanism just for spreading awareness. And they also got input from GAP when, when they were um, practicing. But the training process is a bit weird because you may have all of you join for the first training, and then someone comes for the second one. Do we pick up where we left off? Do we start again to do the, what we already covered? How do, you, how do you facilitate that kind of training? It takes a long time. It's like three to four days, and, and that's a lot of time for GAP staff to be taking away from their jobs. Now imagine, I'll say later, but when they go into the factories, it don't take three to four days from the produc production line. Uh, you have to condense that to one day, and even that's a bit of a, a hassle. So, uh, yeah, and also challenges thinking about how cooperation and communication play out differently in different cultural contexts. Okay. I'm sorry it's a bit brief, but I'm giving you just a flavor, okay? It's okay. Oh, you're good. Um, Gap Inc. Okay, so Gap Inc.'s training better, um, training the bipartite committees. So on the positive, training them is opening up communication between managers and workers and building worker confidence, even though in some cases you see it takes like three to four trainings for workers to open up. Again, the use of role plays, videos, visual examples is very useful. And sometimes the Gap Inc. staff will travel to that country to observe uh, the training. The Better Work staff, I'm sorry, will come and observe Gap and give them some feedback right away, so that's useful. 
but uh, on the problem areas, there's still workers from some cultures think they shouldn't be speaking to management about complex issues. Training sometimes only involves the representatives from one factory, but a firm could have four factories. And how, again, how does that knowledge transfer to other places? Some concern that the committee will turn into a union and so the sensitivity around the issue of industrial relations and unions and what, what are you, why are you trying to get me to join that becomes a problem. So it's a, and it's a challenge to appeal to both manager and worker reps with different educational backgrounds. I mentioned the time constraint. How do you, how do you get this done in one day? How do you get people from the line? In some places there's migrant workers, multiple languages. How do you provide training to, to everyone? The last thing I want to say is that one thing it is doing is helping the switch from the auditor to the trainer role and I have a number of quotes I didn't get a I didn't get a chance to to tell you but basically how it's it's smoothing that relationship a little bit they used to be a manager used to be scared to see the gap person coming to the factory and not and hide things from them now they're willing to lay the, t the, the issue on the table and discuss because they know they're there to help them work to a solution um, so that's one bit about doing work differently. Problem is, like, how do you make this sustainable? How does it, how, this is, all, all these are pictures I took. This is my hotel and my guest house. <laughs> I was like, good morning. Um, how, do you, how do you actually spread this? Uh, how do you strengthen the program, first of all? And once, once there, how can you actually shift towards linking that with practice? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>